Now, if you have your Bibles or Testaments with you, before we uh, do the baptismal service, we'll not be keeping you late tonight. Just because there's a baptismal service doesn't say that we'll be, we'll, we'll be keeping you long. We won't. It doesn't take long doing the baptism. So settle yourself and listen to what God has to say to us. For this is the most important thing. It is the Word of God to us. And we're turning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. And just reading a few verses. You just listen carefully. Now, if you haven't a Bible, don't worry about that. If you have, read the verses with me. And just whisper a wee prayer and say, Lord, you speak to me tonight. I need to hear from you. And he's good at talking to us. And he wants to talk to us. And he will do that tonight if you want. If you want him to. Matthew 28 and verse 16. This is after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus and before his ascension up into heaven. And it says in verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Let me stop there a wee moment. He appointed a place where he would meet them. Judas was gone, and there were only 11 of them. And they had an appointment with him, and twice he told them. He told them before the resurrection, and he tells them after the resurrection that there's a place, an appointed place, where he will meet them. And whenever the Lord <clears throat> tells us, and he speaks to us, not with an audible voice, but he speaks to us through his word, and when he tells us that he wants us to go to a certain place or do a certain thing, like these ones are doing tonight in baptism, then that's an appointment. And he expects you to keep it. And he expects you to be there when he turns up. Remember that now. Let's read it again. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Isn't the, isn't the word of God so powerful? It doesn't cover anything over. Could very easily put a full stop at the worship in there and let those that doubt go there. But no. God's honest with us. There were some, even though the psalm in the flesh, still doubted. I wonder, are there any doubters here tonight? Maybe you're doubting. Well, I pr pray that he'll take all the doubt away. And, but some doubted. Then, verse 18, Jesus came and speak unto them, saying, Some power, not at all. Limited power, not at all. All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. I tell you, that's a big scoop. And because of that, because I'm all powerful in heaven and on earth, and because he is, he has a right to command us. He has a, room, he has a right to tell us whatever he wants to tell us. He says, because I'm all authority and I am all power, and he is tonight. He's the great I am tonight. And he has you just in the palm of his hand tonight. You know, you know what the Word of God says? There's but a step between me and death. Do you know what it says in Daniel? God in whose hand our breath is. He could take your breath away at this moment. So we're talking about one who has all power and all authority over everything. And he says, Go ye therefore because of that and teach all nations, notice the all, all power, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The whole Trinity is involved in this. This is not a Mickey Mouse thing. The whole Godhead's involved here tonight. 
teaching them. Teaching them, that's what I've been doing for 25 years here, 26 years, teaching. Teaching them to observe, here's the all again, all things whatsoever I command you, not some things. And if you're a believer tonight and you're not baptized, you're disobedient. And you're disobeying his command, so don't be expecting blessings. Mass I can be no blunter than that. The whole Trinity is involved in this. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, all things, not some things, all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even on to the end of the age. The world is there. It's the age, on to the end of the age. We're coming near the end of the age. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his word. There are three things essential, imperative, and fundamental to a biblical baptism. Three things essential, imperative, and fundamental for this baptismal service tonight. Number one, the Word of God. The Word. Number two, water. Number three, witnesses. The truth of God's Word, the tank of water, the testimony of the witnesses. Those are the three things that are essential for believers' baptism. Now, I want to take a few minutes on each of them tonight, and I want to set the record straight, because that's my job. And maybe like some, as I've already said, that were gathered with the Lord at Galilee, there's some of you doubting. There's maybe some of you skeptical. There's maybe some of you critical. I don't know. I don't know what's in your heart tonight when you see this tank of water and you see young people going down and coming up out of it. I don't know. But if you knew the Word of God, you would know. Most people say to me, why do we baptize in this fashion? Because the Baptists do it, no. Because the brethren do it, no. Because some of the independent Methodists do it, or the Presbyterians do it, or some of the Church of Ireland do it. No. We do it because the Lord Jesus Christ, and this word, commands it to be done. After he died and rose again, and before his ascension, he said to his disciples, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Now somebody will say to me, oh, but that was for the disciples. Oh, well, you need to read it all. Because we did read today, teaching and observing all these things whatsoever I command thee, even unto the end of the age. We're not at the end of the age yet. And I could go to half a dozen other scriptures to prove this point. We're not at the end of the age yet, but we're coming near. You know, this age is going to end when Jesus Christ burst the clouds and come again. He's going to rapture the church. He's going to take us out like that some of these days. I can tell you there's not one prophecy to be fulfilled before he breaks the clouds and comes and takes his church, his people, his redeemed home. And it's only his redeemed he's taken. And he's coming soon. We're not at the end of the age, but we're near to us listening to the seven o'clock news the other morning. And you know, I got depressed. Three of the headlines, one half the other was man raping another man. A film star arrested for raping of a woman. Next one was child abuse. Some of them politicians, some of them judges, and some of them doctors. That's what your education does for you. 
And I can tell you the education will not take your sin away. You see, sin, my friend, you can't handle it. You can't handle it. It's too fierce. It took the cross and the precious blood of Christ to deal with sin. Nothing else could do it. It took the only sinless man that ever walked the scene of time to die on that old cross for our sins. Not a thing else could do it. All the Baptist tanks in the world couldn't do it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, we're coming near the end of the age. But this old book tells me that until we come to the end of the age, that this is the type of baptism that we need to follow, believer's baptism. It's the very same with the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. It's a command. As often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you do show, the for, show forth the Lord's death until he comes. He hasn't come yet. We meet here every Sunday morning round that table. We have bread and wine on it. We do it because the Word of God tells us to do it. We do it because we want to obey the Lord. And what a blessing it was here this morning. Because the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I done for you at Calvary. That's what we're doing. And that's till he come. He hasn't come yet. For when he comes, we'll not need it. This is from the cross to his coming. And that's why we do that as well. Both these ordinances were faithfully obeyed for the first five centuries in the church. When the early apostles and the evangelists preached the gospel, there was the table, the tank, all was there and the truth. All those things were there. The first sermon Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 souls saved and baptized. So they must have counted them. And I'll show you in a minute now, it's not sprinkling. No, we're just facing the word dead on tonight. 3,000 souls were saved, and then another 2,000 souls were saved. It tells us in Acts, 5,000 souls. They must have counted them coming up out of the water. That was the norm in the early church. Men and women were baptized. Whole households were baptized. There's 116 references to this kind of baptism in the Acts and the Epistles. Baptism of this fashion is not only commanded and continued, but above all, it was countenanced by the Lord Jesus himself. You remember that John the Baptist was baptizing in the River Jordan, and he was the first to baptize. He was baptizing in the River Jordan, and the Lord Jesus, who had no sin, who had no need to be baptized to declare that he was saved because he was without sin, he was wholly harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners, and John didn't want to baptize him, but he remonstrated till a measure with John. He says, you must, you must baptize me so that things will be fulfilled, and John baptized my Savior into the, in, 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 in the Jordan River, and it wasn't a clean river and is still not. So the eternal Son of God who created all things by the word of his power, who lives now in, the, in, the, in, in, in heaven's glory, the mighty I am of all things, he condescended down and humbled himself down into the dirty waters of the Jordan. And some of his followers will not do it for him. Shameful. And he did. Oh yes, it was countenanced by the Lord. And when he came up out of the water, the Lord Jesus, when he came up out of the water, there came a voice from heaven. And the voice was God saying, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And I tell you this, when these young people come up out of this water tonight, it will bring joy to the heart of God. But I've never been in a baptism in 25 years. We're baptizing people here. And before we had a tank here, we took them somewhere else. Baptized 26 or something in one night. Some of them in the meeting tonight. 
I can tell you I never have been to a baptismal service that when people got baptized and obeyed the Lord that they weren't blessed in their soul. And you ask these pair afterwards tonight and you'll find that to be the truth. There's the truth of the word. There's the tank of water. John baptized in the Jordan. And here's what it says. Because there was much water there. That's why he baptized. We're not talking about a spoonful of water now. We're not talking about sprinkling water. He baptized in the Jordan because there was much water there. And of course, as I have hammered out year after year in this place, the word baptizo is the Greek word to go down under. That's why they're going to go down under this tonight. Because the Greek word is baptizo, down under. It was the same word used when they dyed a garment uh, in the Greek language, and they dyed a garment. Well, if you're dyeing a garment and you want to dye it all, you have to plunge it down into the dye. There's no use leaving the tail end of it out for it'll not all be done. That's the down under. Down under. It was the same word used when a ship sank and went down into the midst of the sea. The cry went out, Baptizos, down! We're only doing what the Word tells us to do. One of my early memories on the farm way back in County Vermont, and I've told you this before, for I was brought up, you know, with horses as well as tractors. My father had tractors and he had horses. And it fell my lot more than once to ride a horse for three miles from our farmhouse into the forge in Derragonley to get the horse shoed. And it wasn't big. And I'll tell you how small it was. I had to get up on a gate. And my father led the horse into the gate and I stepped off the gate onto the horse so I couldn't get off, whether I wanted it or not. I had to sit there. And whatever that old horse done, I had to sit there till I got into the forge in Derragonley town, Charlie Portis and Andy Flaherty, they were the two forge men. And I tell you, Charlie Portis was as black as the anvil that he was hammering on and his hands were as thick and they were callous. And you know, after that I learned two lessons from Charlie Portis. One was this. He used to put that horseshoe into the furnace and he used to chew tobacco and he used to spit in after it. And he'd, he'd pull the bellows, bellows, and I tell you that thing, you'd see it reddening and getting red and getting red, getting red, and then he'd take it out under the handle and he'd hit it a couple of cracks and he'd put it back in again. I learned a lot from Charlie Portis and the, ha- and the handle, and, and he'd do it again, and it'd come out red hot, and then he'd put it into the bucket of water. He had an old bucket of water, and he went down, you'd hear the smoke, see the smoke and the, and the noise going off it, but I tell you, he put it right down into the bucket. He baptized it into it. Oh, he couldn't leave one end of that out, you know. And then he used to put in his big black hand and he'd lift it out. And I can tell you it wasn't, it wasn't cool, but his hands were hard. That was another lesson I learned. Boys, he had big, thick calluses on his hand. I guarantee you if any of us would have touched that horseshoe, I tell you, it may not have been red, but I'll tell you it was hot. But Manny just lifted it out like a sweet. His hand was callous, it was hard. And you know there's a lot of people like that tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you've heard the gospel time and time again. And you've got harder and harder and harder. The more times Charlie done it, the harder the old hand got. The more times, my friend, we hear this word because it's the savor of life unto life and death unto death and the same sun that softens the clay, hardens the earth. How many times have you heard the gospel? 
How many times have you heard the call, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out? How many times have you heard the call to be baptized? This is the only mode of baptism mentioned in the Word of God. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. And I challenge any man or woman to get me a verse or a part of a verse in the Old Testament or the New Testament for infant baptism. Come on. I've never saw anybody giving me a verse over 44 years on infant baptism, sprinkling or pouring. Every time we read about it, it says something like this. When they believed with all their heart, they were saved. When they repented, they were baptized. When they, were saved. when they repented of their sin, they were baptized. I tell you, my friend, a baby one month old and one foot long cannot repent. And cannot believe. This has not taken away these people's sin tonight. Get that into your head. That has already been done. I've spoken to both of them. I know that it's done. I see it in their lives. Even young as they are. There was a moment when they had an encounter with God and they asked them into their heart to save them from their sin. And they know it. And that's why they're doing this. They're not doing it to please their parents. Not a bit of them. Nor to please me either. And I'm glad of that. No, no, they're doing it because there was a time when they had an encounter with God and they want to publicly declare tonight, we're not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus that died for me and rose for me and saved me from my sin. I'm not ashamed of him. No, no. This is the only baptism that's mentioned, my friend, in the word of God. If baptism was necessary for salvation, then there was nobody saved in the Old Testament because there was no baptisms in the Old Testament. If baptism is necessary for salvation, all the teaching of the Apostle Paul is wrong when he said that great, great truths of, of salvation. For instance, by grace are you saved through faith, not being baptized. By grace are ye saved through faith. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is a gift that you take, you receive. When the Holy Spirit is dealing in your life and he's showing you the Son of God that died for you to give you eternal life and peace with God and assurance of heaven and all well when death comes. To give you a happy Christmas because you'll not have a happy Christmas without him. You'll not have a happy Christmas in the pub. I was in them for 25 years. I was brought up in a home that knew nothing, only drink. I never had a happy Christmas. I had drunken Christmases until that mighty day the Lord saved me. Ah, what a day that was, 44 years ago. It was the best day of my life. Better day, and I thank God for the day I met my wife and the day that I got married to her. But it was a better day than that. When I left school, it was a great day, but it was a better day than that. Oh, I tell you, this is real tonight. It's real. By grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, not being baptized. So there's the truth of the word. There's the tank of water. And lastly, there's the testimony of the witnesses. Amy and Hayden are partaking of something that the Lord has told them to do. And they're unashamedly a witnessing tonight to the fact that there was a time in their life when they had an encounter with God. And when they go down into this tank, that's all that they're saying. They're just saying Christ died and was buried. 
And on the third day he rose again. And they're declaring just what the Savior has done as a witness and a testimony to him. And I will baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost because that's how he's told us to do. All Trinity is involved. I tell you, my friend, this is big business. They are all the Trinities involved for this reason as I close. We have been elected by the Father. We have been sanctified and set apart by the Spirit, and we have been redeemed by the Son. It's all part of it. Can't separate it. That's the miracle of working of the new birth in a man or woman's life when we're set apart, when we're elected by the Father, set apart by the Spirit, redeemed by the Son. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by his infinite mercy, his child. And forever, not for a day or two, forever, I am. We have redemption through the blood, even the forgiveness of sin. All heaven is involved. And all heaven's interested in this tonight. It's the testimony of the witnesses and the tribute of the witnesses. For as I said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and he'll be well pleased. That's the tribute tonight. He will be well pleased. And listen, my dear friend, we have baptized some people here in the past 25 years and over in the old hall and other places. We've baptized Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists. We've baptized drunkards and atheists and solicitors and teachers. You're all on the level ground here. All on the level ground here. All humbling ourselves to declare to all around us that the Lord has saved me and I love him with all my heart. And I close tonight with the words of Philip to the eunuch as they went across the desert. The Ethiopian eunuch, the chancellor of the exchequer of Ethiopia, that great man who was second in command to Queen Candace, one of the richest nations in the world at that time. And he's coming through over the desert and he's reading Isaiah 53. And God said to Philip, go and get onto that chariot and talk to that man. And from Isaiah 53, he showed him that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. He showed him the Savior. There's nothing in Isaiah 53 you know about baptism. And, and, and Philip got up onto the chariot and he sat with this big uh, chancellor of the exchequer, big colored man. He was the first to bring them the, the, the message of the gospel down into Africa. And he explains Isaiah 53. He says, who's this, who's this speaking about? Who's the prophet speaking about here? Is he speaking about some other man? Or who's he speaking about? He says, and he preached unto him Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripe. By his stripes we are healed. And then, then we read on that in the next verse he says, here is water, what does hinder you to be baptized? Where did that come from? Hmm? Well, it's not in Isaiah 53. I'll tell you where it came from. It came from Philip the Evangelist because that's the gospel that he preached. They didn't separate it in those days, you know. It's part and parcel of the gospel. But when a man or woman gets saved, the next thing to do is to obey the Lord and be baptized. We have separated it. He says, here is water. Doesn't I say to you tonight that are not baptized, here's water. What hinders you? Hmm? What hinders you tonight? Come on, let the Holy Spirit search your heart now. What hinders you? What keeps you back? For well, there's something keeps you back. And take care, but you'll get like Charlie Portis. 
You'll be able to sit under preaching like this and it'll not do you that bit of harm. That's dangerous. Dangerous. Here is water, what hath hindered me to baptize? And he got out of the chariot with this big man and all the retinue of people that he had with him, guards and advisors and all, stood by and they watched and, and it says that he went down into the water. It says, when he came up out of the water, so he had to go down in to come up. And don't you tell me that he'd been in the desert of Gaza in the wilderness, away out beyond nowhere in complete and utter desert. Don't you tell me he wouldn't have had a drop of water with him? He'd had bottles of water with him. Well, that's not the baptism he's after. He's after this here. And that's what we're after tonight, is obeying the Lord. May God help us. And may God bless these pair tonight as Roy and I and they go out to change and Stephen takes over and gives out a hymn. Thank you.